Welcome back to Marriage Isn't Dead, where we keep monogamy hot, fun, and sexy through self-improvement. This episode, we're going to talk about the life cycle of a marriage and relationships in general to a point, but mainly we're going to focus on marriage from dating to death. And we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls associated with each stage. So stay tuned for that. So most of these things that I'm going to talk about here are we're talking about healthy relationships, but I'll talk about some of the pitfalls associated with it as well. So let's start with dating. I did a full episode on the stages of relationships, the three main stages of relationships for all of them. I'll put a little card up here for that. When a couple gets to know each other, they build a connection. It takes time to assess compatibility. It's usually around 18 to 24 months. Uh, limerence particularly lasts from 18 months to 36 months. But a lot of marriages and relationships typically build on about two years, give or take. I highly recommend that time frame before you start even thinking about marriage or, or moving in with each other. You get through the limerence, you get through the beginning of a, of a relationship, and you get to engagement. Engagement, I recommend at about 18 to 24 months, give or take. There's another trend that I'm seeing with younger people is where they get engaged, but the engagement is prolonged. They don't really set a date for the marriage right after engagement, and it can go on like that for years. Getting engaged at about a year and a half, two years, and about an eight to eight months to about a year engagement, that's what I would consider normal. And I think healthy. It takes some time to plan a wedding. <laughs> Obviously, it's expensive. You don't want to jump into it and uh, give us some plans because uh, there's a lot of planning involved when it comes to, to to marriage. But what do you do in that time frame where you get engaged and the the wedding? That's usually where cohabitation occurs. A lot of people rush into uh, living together. That's a very common problem that I see in the couples that I've coached in the past where they met each other and within three months, they're living together. I don't recommend that. Cohabitation should happen when you know you're going to be with this person long term. And right around 18 months to 24 months, like I said, that's when you start combining finances Get yourself a joint account. Uh, that's another trend that I'm seeing with young people not uh, joining their finances. I don't recommend that personally. It sets up a dynamic where you're going to be in competition with each other financially, and that could cause problems down the road. I recommend combining fan finances. I know every situation is different, but generally speaking, com combining finances will decrease the likelihood of competition when it comes to to money. Marriage is hard enough as it is. Why make it more difficult? In my opinion, that is that's going to make things more difficult. Combining finances, typically that simplifies things. An exception might be a second marriage. Um, I know some people go through second marriages and it works better for them if they have separate uh, bank accounts. It's all good, but you should have a, a one account where both of you draw from. That's just me. During the engagement phase, you determine what's expected of each other regarding chores when you start cohabitating. Uh, I recommend men embrace the traditional masculine roles around the house. Outside stuff is more him and inside stuff's more hers. That's generally speaking, works pretty well. Things have blurred in this regard dramatically from the latter 20th century, but Generally speaking, guys should be taking care of the, the masculine roles and women should embrace the feminine roles. Take it or leave it on that. That's, there's a reason why those roles exist. Uh, if you've got a wife that enjoys working on cars, by all means, you can change the oil. You can rotate the tires. You can, you can do that. Be my guest. Uh, if you've got a guy that loves cooking, great. Be my guest. It's just a suggestion. So that's the engagement phase. The next phase is the wedding and the honeymoon phase. So that's a fun and exciting time. It's associated with newness. Who doesn't enjoy a good wedding? Easy button. Not much to talk about here. I love weddings myself. They're a lot of fun. And uh, who doesn't enjoy it? I mean, it's life on easy mode at that point. So that's the second stage. The third stage 
that's settling in after the wedding, after the honeymoon, you're starting to really settle into married life. Usually involves solidifying a career and advancement. And it's usually associated with home buying if that hasn't been done already. Uh, the cohabitation portion of this absolutely is a big deal when it comes to marriage. Routines are established at that point, and monotony could become a problem for some. Challenges usually happen at or after this stage, as up until now, things are relatively easy. Things are on easy mode and uh, when you get married in the honeymoon stage, but the settling in stage, that's where problems can arise. Uh, compatibility issues that you didn't see coming, they usually come up at this point, especially if you rush into marriage, if you've got a couple that, uh, that spent you know, three months in the engagement phase and is married within six to 12 months, you're going to be, you're going to be wondering why did I marry this person uh, in some cases? And in some cases you might be, you might be positively surprised. It could go both ways, but in my experience, typically it goes the former. Typically you're going to run into some problems that you didn't see coming and it's, it can cause a lot of marital problems. There's lots of give and take at this stage when you start figuring out how to live your lives. Newness wears off here and boredom can set in in some cases, especially for folks that really enjoy adventure. Uh, they're, they're very open kind of people. Sometimes married life can f seem really monotonous to someone like that. And uh, that's why one of the highest divorce rates happens at one to two years of marriage. Either you've rushed into things, you're not compatible, you don't like married life, it's monotonous, it's difficult. All of those things happen. And that's why a lot of divorces happen at, uh, at one to two years of marriage. Buyer's remorse is very real here. Uh, so what's the next step after that? Kids. Absolutely, kids. So that's the this is the fourth stage, the newborn stage in particular. The newborn stage is the biggest wet blanket you'll ever have on your romantic sex life, by far. It's a huge adjustment going from a married couple, just a, just a married couple, to parenthood. <laughs> but it's, it's the most rewarding long-term but it is very difficult to begin with. Many people can't do it. Uh, like I said, they came from a broken home. They don't know what it looks like uh, to raise children uh, in, a, in a healthy way. And this is where a lot of people don't want to hear this, but a lot of times this is where you become your parent. Some people will absolutely resist being like their mother or father, but it just kind of happens when it comes to the newborns because that, that was the example that you had. That was the, the model that you had growing up. So it's critical for healthy couples to work on maintaining the romantic side when it comes to parenthood, when you're, you're brand new parents. Many people that go through this stage don't see it coming. It comes easy for some, it comes hard for others, or never for a lot of people. It's very difficult to maintain your sex life when it comes to parenting. You're going to be tired you, your lack of sleep, your schedules are going to be all messed up. It's, it's a difficult time when you're dealing with infants. And most of the couples that I talk to in coaching, they're at this stage. This is, this is a typical stage. Newborns to uh, toddlers, very, very common. And dead bedrooms are very commonplace at this stage. Dead bedrooms, by definition, is having sex less than 10 times a year. Very common at this stage. A lot of people get wrapped up in parenting and they just forget about uh, their sex lives, um, especially ladies. Guys have testosterone, so they don't, they still have their sex drive. But when it comes to ladies, a lot of times this is where they'll go headstrong right into motherhood and they forget about the lover side. Very common, very common. So that's uh, the fourth stage. So what's next? The grade school stage. I call this the busy stage. This is a very common stage of divorce. Typically happens right around five to eight years in marriage. And frankly, this is probably the most common group 
or stage of a marriage where divorce is at its most likely. Most of the people that I talk to in coaching are in this stage. This is the stage where couples usually create distance by either being too lazy or just they just totally forget about the romantic side and they're not a married couple anymore. They're just parents. That's a very, very common scenario and uh, very easy to do, uh, especially in modern times. Uh, this created a lot of pressure to get involved in activities. I'm a Gen X guy, grew up in the 80s and 90s. We didn't have all of these leagues and baseball leagues and soccer leagues and all this stuff to to distract us as of as a married couple. And it's a very common problem that I see in a lot of couples, especially in the United States. Teamwork is key here, but you can lose the romantic side very easily. Like I said, this is probably the most common stage of marriage there where people come to me for advice uh, and, and help, especially men in dead bedrooms. This is a very, very common stage. Probably I'd say 75% of the people that come to me are in this stage. So what happens is they lost the spark. They need to rekindle it. Those are the kind of people that I love talking to because they're typically a little easier to help. And honestly, it's one of my target audiences, uh, whether when they've lost the spark, they want to rekindle it. Usually it's pretty easy to pick up the pieces at that stage. Uh, if you're in a full-on dead bedroom where you, you haven't had sex with your partner for two years, three years, the likelihood of turning that around is very difficult. I've seen it done, uh, but it's that's a tall mountain to climb. So that's the fifth stage. That's the grade school stage. That's the busy stage. Big one. So here comes the next stage. It's midlife with teens. Personally, this is where I'm at in my marriage. I've uh, been married for 20 years, happily married, uh, got a great life, got a got two kids, a boy and a girl, they're both in their teens, middle school age and high school age. This is a stage where your your kids become more independent and it lightens your load dramatically. It's usually right around age 40 to 45, typically. Uh, a sexual awakening can happen at this point, uh, commonly in ladies particularly and couples at this stage, but uh, they become more comfortable with their body. They know what they like. They become more open. And uh, there's more time to devote to the romantic side for both of you. A lot of people will wake up and say, wait a second, we've, we're have we not acting like a married couple anymore. We're just parents. And we need to go on date nights more, go away for a weekend. Uh, they're a lot more comfortable with leaving their kids with someone uh, for a weekend or, or a night away. This is actually, this could be a very, very fun part of your marriage, uh, but it can also be a very difficult part of your marriage because this is, it can go the other way as well when it comes to menopause, perimenopause, health concerns, pretty common problems that I see when I talk to people uh, at this stage. Just, just generally speaking, sometimes you can have uh, health issues. It's also a very common time for affairs uh, if the marriage is struggling. I've noticed that quite often at this stage when you have teens. Both sexes are equally capable of infidelity. Uh, the stats say it's kind of all over the place, but generally speaking, about 15 to 20 percent of men and women will cheat. Uh, that's about one in, one in five. That's a lot. Uh, the statistics say men are more likely, but it, it definitely can go both ways. Uh, most of the people that I talk to are guys, so I hear about the infidelity of women a lot, but I know men cheat a lot too. Midlife crises are very common from 40 to 45 for both men and women. Midlife crises look a little bit different from, for men and women, but generally speaking, this is the stage that's going to happen. So the next stage, empty nest, early retirement. So your kids have moved out, and you settle back into being a married couple. Just you too. Some people thrive at this stage and others crater. I want you to be the former. How do you do that? Stick around in this channel and I will help you be that person slash couple. I want to help you. This is the stage where great divorce happens. So quote unquote great divorce it's on the rise due to damage that's done in the previous stages, but it's on the rise now in modern times, and it's way more common than it was in the 80s and 90s. 
A big reason that I started this channel was to combat this new trend. The rate of gray divorce has literally doubled from 1990. Uh, gray divorce, if you didn't know, that's divorce uh, when you have an empty nest. Uh, people that have been married 20 to 25 years, getting divorced at that age is on the rise. The main focus of my channel is you can raise kids and have a fun, sexy marriage at the same time. That is possible and needed. You can balance the load. Most people just don't know how to do that, and that's what I'm here for. If you like this content, like, share, and subscribe so you can get my next episodes. I'm just getting started with this channel. I plan on being here for years. So when it comes to empty nesting, some people transition right into grandparenting, but most people will have around 10 years of potential making up for lost time here. And that's, that's kind of your goal when it comes to empty nesting. Your love life might suffer a little bit when it comes to kids, your romantic side, your married life. But this is a good time to make up for lost time. Absolutely. So that brings us to our last stage, the golden years. If I had a nickel for how many times I've heard somebody say that the golden years are not so golden, I want to make it a goal for you to never say that. The golden years are something to look forward to. Retirement is something to look forward to. It's just a question of getting there with your health, your, your mental status, uh, and your marital status. If you've got those things in place, you're going to have a pretty good retirement. And I want that for you. I've seen plenty of people in their 80s have a very active lifestyle at that age. Stay active, physically active, challenge yourself, watch your diet. All of those things matter when it comes to living a good life in your golden years. The other thing that I can see now as a parent of two teens, I can see the true beauty of having grandkids. It's really a do-over without the financial and career stressors that you've had when you had your own kids when they were babies and infants. You're building your life at that point. You're super busy. Well, as grandparents, a lot of that stuff goes away. And it's I, I really can understand why grandkids are, are special at this point in my life, personally. Enjoy your golden years. Enjoy your retirement. That's what I want for you. So that, those are all the stages when it comes to dating through, uh, through death for a healthy marriage. Uh, give you some of those pitfalls to look for. So in closing, the three major danger zones of marriage are the initial two years of marriage, it's the eight to 10 years of marriage, and then the empty nesting phase. Those are the three major danger zones that I see when it comes to coaching and, uh, and all the people that I've talked to, and usually the stats back that up. Personally, I think the eight to 10 year mark, that's the critical mark. The seven-year itch. I mean, that there's a reason why that's a that's a cliche. A lot of people just can't get over the the eight to ten-year mark for a number of reasons. But it takes about that time frame for a, a marriage that started out on on bad footing, or somebody that's that's lost their way, didn't really know how to do marriage well. That's usually the time frame that it takes. So, I'm glad you're listening to this. If you're at that stage. I've given you some things to work on. And the biggest thing that I wanted to, to, to hit home in this episode was that every single stage of, the, of relationships, there's hurdles and there's opportunities. You make the most of each stage and you have the best chance long-term to have a lifelong marriage. As long as you know they're coming. Most people just don't know the pitfalls until they're past them. This episode gives you that edge. So if you're just getting started out in marriage or you haven't got married yet at all, there you go. The, this episode will give you a huge advantage when it comes to being married. So if you like this content, join our private Facebook group. Got plenty of people in there that talk about marriage, about relationships, about fun stuff. Uh, and we try to try to learn from each other and we try to try to help people through that group. And like, share, and subscribe so you get notified of new episodes. And as always, be better than you were yesterday and be desirable.